you know that. So, so thank you for being prompt and ready, for having bright eyes even in the dimming light, and for being here to spend some time in good thought at midday. Nothing better than that. No time for metaphor from me, no time for intellectual drift. We need to respect the integrity of the hour and move quickly to the main and radiant event. After the talk is finished, all that good food and coffee turns for us. We'll assemble in the back of the room for informal questions and more talk. But now, to move us onward, inward and upward, I introduce my good friend and esteemed colleague, Jahan Hamzani. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. You've been doing such a terrific job as post-director, director of this great institute. We all believe such a debt. It's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Ellen Bomer, Professor of World Literature at Oxford. Professor Bomer um, was last year, 10 years ago, uh, some of you wouldn't remember her from that, but uh, some of us do. And her status as a repeat invitee is an indication of our collective esteem and fondness for her here at the University of Virginia. A graduate of Rhodes University in South Africa, she attended Oxford on Rhodes Scholarship and stayed on to write a DPhil on a thesis on the nation in postcolonial African literature. She taught at Leeds, I hope I'll get them all, Nottingham Trent. Lord of Holloway, maybe and others, uh, but, uh, University of London, before taking her current position at Oxford in 2007. And all of that time, she's been a force in postcolonial studies. She's a prolific reviewer, anthologist, editor, serving on the editorial board, numerous prestigious journals in the field, editing a postcolonial book series at OEP, editing collections on topics such as terror, novelist Jane Katsia, and the Indian postcolonial, and co-leading major multi-year research projects on issues such as violence, race, the modern making of Britain by South Asian immigrants. She's probably best known to many of us as the author of the most lucid, cogent, comprehensive overview of the field, both colonial and postcolonial literature, migrant metaphors, uh, published in 1995 and then revised for 2005. A book in which he surveys uh, colonial currents and anti-colonial countercurrents in writing by Trollope, Kipling, Conrad, Lawrence, Mansfield, Orwell, as well as Shrinka, Nightfall, Katsia, Mdache, Cliff, Atwood, and many, many others, developing rich meditations on imperial self-justification, colonial masculinity, the unreadability of the other, metropolitan modernism and empire, nationalist resistance and self-representation, and the rewriting of master narratives. If Professor Bomer's first critical book is dazzlingly <coughs> wide-ranging, and as she rightly concedes, almost imperialistic in scope, her second, Empire, the Nation, and Postcolonial, 1890 and 1920, Resistance and Interaction, focuses on a few case studies. Irish support of the Boers in the Boer War, the partnership between an Englishwoman and a Dali extremist, an early South, black South African nationalist, and Gates and Leonard Hill, <coughs> and metropolitans. She definitely reorients postcolonial studies in this book from its vertical axis, uh, the preoccupation that's always had with ag the ag agonistic um, and hierarchical relationships between colonizer and colonized, to emphasize instead the horizontal axis of cross-cultural, which equals cross-cultural, cross-border exchange, really across the globe. Encounters, which equals encounters, link-ups, intersections, interbreeding, interdiscursivity. And this is, of course, especially among uh, nationalist writers of the period, as in the development of core Bengali nationalist concepts, partly out of an awareness of Sinn Féin's notion of self-help, Sinn Féin being ourselves alone, and partly out of indigenous traditions. In her revisionary narr narrative, nationalism becomes, perhaps ironically, one of the most co cosmopolitan, appropriable, and interstitial discourses to circulate across widely scattered regions of the British Empire. Professor Bomer's third critical book, Stories of Women, Gender, and narrative, sorry, stories of women, gender and narrative in the post nation, 2005, 
powerfully demonstrates the importance of gender in the constructions of postmodern national identity, engaging a wide range of theorists, from Fanon to Ben Anderson, and novelists from Africa and South Asia in particular, such as Ngugi, Achebe, Benokri, and Arundhati Roy. It's already acclaimed as canonical in the field. I'll say a lot less about her fourth book, Nelson Mandela, a very short introduction, since this introduction is already failing her standard in not being very short, and since you'll soon hear from Professor Bomer herself on the subject of Nelson Mandela. So let me make way and just wrap up by saying richly researched, historically detailed, theoretically aware, yet sustaining a nimble and nuanced style of argument, Professor Bomer's work is also pleasure to read, as you might expect of someone who's about to publish the fifth of her five novels alongside the fifth of her five critical studies, the latter entitled Networks of Empire, keeping a beautiful balance of those creative and critical faculties. During her return visit to Virginia, Elika Bomer has been wonderfully generous to students and faculty with her time, energy, and attention. For all these reasons, I hope you'll please join me in warmly welcoming Elka Bomer, who will speak today on Madiba, Magic, Charisma, Rhetoric, Authority, Love. Of that recognizability, that particular claim. 
until quite late in his career, Mandela's significant and, to my mind, lasting achievements as an ethical thinker and a far-sighted negotiator were perhaps under-recognized because he often appeared in a contradictory light. He was perceived, or he came across, as a gentleman and an Anglophile, almost in an Edwardian tradition. He loved a good suit, he loved a nice tie, he was very correct and proper in his manners. Yet, he was also, certainly in his youth, a firebrand African nationalist and a political radical. He was a Democrat and a freedom fighter. Yet, by contrast again, his political style was often autocratic. In his own words, he liked to lead from the front, like a shepherd. And in fact, what he, one of the jobs that he did as, as a student, uh, as, 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 a, as a youth, was to, to shepherd the cattle. So he, so he learned from that this somewhat autocratic style that he could use. In terms of style and image, he appeared to send out mixed messages, therefore. But also on a political level, he often acted in what even his friends, but certainly his critics pointed out, was inconsistent ways. In part, these mixed perceptions rose from his longevity and the fact that he underwent several changes of, of heart across his extended career. So, you know, he was 95 by the time he died. So he went, he went through significant different stages across that long career. So almost inevitably contradictory, we might say. Moreover, through his achievements <coughs> as a political leader, though his achievements as a political leader re rested on strength of character and a talent for negotiation, these features were combined with the important factor of his career-long proximity to several outstanding colleagues and friends, themselves astute political minds, in particular, Oliver Tambo and Walter Sisulu. So there again is a contrast. We, we recognize Mandela, we, we uh, understand Mandela to have been almost a lone colossus, a political colossus, a colossus of freedom struggle. But in fact, he, his achievement was a collective achievement. And he, he himself was the first always to recognize this. My successes, he would say, over and over again, have been built on the work of a whole group of people of very, very close colleagues. So in this, in this talk, I'm going to touch on aspects of that, of uh, Mandela's, if you like, contradictory reputation. But I'm also going to think then about legacy, uh, about Mandela's ethical leadership and the political contribution that remains pertinent to us today and salient into the future. In particular, towards the end, the biography began to ask questions that, if anything, have grown in importance today, six years on from publication. Questions about his, his, his political gift to us uh, as activists, as theorists, as post-colonialists, as we move into the, further into the 21st century. As we ask, what his experience of endurance and overcoming teaches us that we can take forward? In particular, then, I want to look at Mandela's contribution as what I would like to call a theorist in practice, a pragmatic champion of reconciliation. This theory in practice, I believe, represents his most significant and lasting contribution. That, in a way, is my talk in a nutshell. I use this terminology of theory and practice as Mandela was not a political philosopher in any conventional or recognizable way. His breakthrough perceptions on national and racial reconciliation were achieved and communicated through practice, in situ, through discussion, on the job, often experimentally, often almost intuitively, moving fluidly from one position of negotiation to another. And it must also be said that, that he never set himself up, he would never have claimed for himself the position of political thinker. He was, he, he was a leader, he was, he was a politician. So however much he may have been a master tactician, gifted with acute political nous and an intuitive sense of political timing, he was not, though, a systematic thinker. He was not, in that sense, a theorist of anti-colonial resistance like Gandhi or even Nehru might be seen. Gandhi, who through a series of dialogic writings, most notably collected in him, Swaraj, developed his idea, his revolutionary ideas of counter-modernity, of soul force, and of non-cooperation with institutionalized power, imperial power. 
So to mount my case for Mandela's contribution as a theorist in practice, I will touch on the evidence we do have of how he worked out and put across his political ideas. In particular, I'm going to focus on his speeches in the first part of the talk. Even taking very short examples, which is all that I have time for, of his speech making from both the beginning and the end of his long career, we gain a strong sense of his overriding strategic and pragmatic approach, of his relentless consensus building, and his growing sense, especially in his last two decades, of what I will call the ecumenical human. I'll then move on to look more closely at what is at stake in conceiving of Mandela as a political thinker, what, uh, to coin a phrase, Mandela-esque political approach might look like. How did, I will ask, Mandela convey his core values through dialogue, through reaching out to others, in particular his enemies, his opponents? Uh, and what is that key importance to him of recognizing the other through friendship and love? I want to look at that quite, quite closely, but again, necessarily in brief, right at the end. And then I will look at a particular example, a case study, if you like, of his identificatory approach. Namely, how he, find, how he found a way of reconciling with his arch enemy, the Afrikaner government and the Afrikaner people, through the recognition of a set of values held in common. And this is really the greatest reversal, if you like, that Mandela turned through, the greatest contradiction, if you like, that he turned through, that he managed across his long career, that he went from an oppositional relationship, uh, a, a, a militant, a struggle relationship with uh, the Afrikaner people to a relationship of working together. So three stages then. Mandela's contribution is a rhetorician, difficult word, rhetorician, then Mandela's contribution as a theorist in action, and then a short case study demonstration of this. And then uh, I, I uh, conferred with Michael about this. I think it would be great for all of us just to have a very quick thumbnail sketch of, of Mandela's life. This is very quick, but just to sort of put us all in the picture. I'm sure a lot of this is, is familiar to many of you. A quick thumbnail biographical sketch then. Nelson Mandela was South Africa's first democratic president and remains one of the world's longest detained political prisoners, having endured 27 and a half years of imprisonment on Robben Island and then later in Pauls Moor and Victor Fester prisons. He was imprisoned for life on a charge of treason, narrowly missing the death sentence in 1964, and walked into freedom in February 1919. Before his imprisonment, he was, during the 1950s, one of the leaders of the peaceful, Gandhi-inspired, uh, ANC-led, African National Congress-led defiance campaign. And then, when that was suppressed by the apartheid regime, the underground leader of the newly formed armed wing of the African National Congress called MK. For over four decades, while his country was rightly vilified the world over for its apartheid policies of state-sanctioned racism, Mandela symbolically, and only to some extent practically, led the movement of resistance to that injustice. He was a symbolic figurehead. He was in prison. He had no television. He had no means of communicating from Robben Island with the outside world. So for, for several decades, he was, to a great extent, a symbolic leader. Between 1990, when he walked into freedom, and 94, he negotiated with his former enemy for a new democratic dispensation in South Africa, and he and the then South African president, F.W. de Klerk, jointly received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1993. And, after South Africa's first democratic elections in April 1994, Mandela was inaugurated as president of that country. He served one term as president, handing over power gracefully uh, and, and, and quite exhaustedly in a way. He was tired. He was ready to retire, handing over power gracefully to President Thabo Mbeki uh, in 1999. So how then might we characterize the ethical political approach on which Nelson Mandela's reputation rests? 
Is it built on his political and strategic capacity for negotiation, for forging reconciliation in a time of near civil war, or on his ethically based capacity to embrace multitudes, on how he was able to encompass those contradictions that I was touching on? How do we make critical sense of the many contrasting qualities that constitute this exceptional man's life? As that very brief bio sketch that I gave you immediately reminds us, Mandela was a man of astonishing moral conviction, especially in how he <coughs> survived 27 and a half years of political incarceration without bitterness. He's not a religious man, but that achievement of surviving those years without bitterness is based on moral conviction. The decision he took at the end of that period to hold out a hand of reconciliation to his opponents was unprecedented, I'd, I'd submit, as a political gesture and incredibly courageous because he had his own party against him for a period of time. Yet that strength was at great cost in personal and emotional terms. His children and his grandchildren have written about his distance from them throughout the time of their union, his coldness, his seeming remoteness. And the decision that he took was by no means uncontroversial politically, as I, as I already intimated, due to the kinds of compromise it entailed. Until Mandela's decision to move to negotiation also raised questions, because initially at least, it had been largely worked out in camera, rather than through, say, public debates and discussions. Necessarily so, we might say, because we're talking here of a political prisoner, so necessarily his, his discussions took place behind walls behind bars. Yet these questions emphasized an important point about Mandela's public presence, and in particular his speech making, as I've already suggested. <coughs> Unlike Nehru or Gramsci say in their prison writings, there was no lasting public medium through which Mandela worked out his ideas. In recent years, in, still in his lifetime, about two years ago, Conversations with Myself was published. It's really just a, a, a snippets of dialogue uh, occasional thoughts. It's not a bit like a, 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 a worked out uh, case for a certain political position. Moreover, unlike that leader with whom he is often compared, familiar to you, Barack Obama, Mandela was not known for particularly high flown or inspiring rhetoric. Mandela's speeches have tended across time to be occasional and opportunistic, driven by circumstance and powered by that ambience of authority, that charisma that he was able to project. Also powered by his actor's feel for an audience. He was, he, he was a performer par excellence. You could spend the, this whole uh, lecture talking about that. Even so, his standout speeches were often characterized by an interesting turn or calibration of meanings, very precisely pitched to convince an audience, especially one doubters or fence-sitters. As we will see in a moment, his turns and reversals, his devices, if you want the rhetorical term, his devices of peripatea, I was able to turn a speech uh, and, and often encapsulate those, those moments of turn, encapsulate in his speeches the shift of opinion or the change of heart that he was attempting to explain or justify in the nation at large. So many of his speeches then were very successful performance pieces. Mandela was never unaware. Said Barack Obama, go there. Focus on Mandela. Mandela was never unaware of the power of making a physical statement, of the efficacy, whether in public or private, of certain persona, certain masks. We might also say, <coughs> of how his life might be read as a model for African mobility and political success, and he played to that awareness. He shared with Gandhi and arguably Barack Obama, but also other strong uh, anti-colonial leaders. The sense that method and medium are central to politics, that principle is most effectively conveyed, often through display. Political success, to a great extent, means transmitting a more humanly convincing message than does one's opponent. Mandela showed that he understood this precept and he embraced it. In general, Mandela was always a more impressive speaker in court than out of it. He was trained as a lawyer. The advocate's bench and the dock granted him a certain license as a crowd pleaser, where he learned to mold his formal tones to fit the smooth modulations of a legal argument. Elsewhere, on other podia, 
Motivated by a strong sense of responsibility to his nation, his people, he consistently tried to avoid appearing with the, rhetoric, the rhetorician. So in court, he, he, he granted himself a license to, to exude charisma, to, 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 to be the rhetorician. Out of court, he was often, uh, he, he felt politically obliged to put across a certain uh, political message. To encourage support, to encourage consensus, it was important to Mandela to use a pared down, generalist language. The verbs straightforward and workmanlike, the nouns often abstract, freedom, democracy, but unadorned. He was, he, was, he was not a speech maker given to using many adjectives. Unlike on those relatively rare occasions where his anger at an abuse of power was expressed as exhortation, upbraiding his, his audience, Mandela's was a public discourse from which the affect had been extracted. We were not to know, we were rarely to know how Mandela, the human being, felt, the human being behind these speeches. For one as dedicated as he was to achieving consensus through the assertion of agreed upon principles and moving his opponent closer to his own position, it made no sense for him to amplify or overqualify his words. And this is one reason why I feel he was so fond of cliché. It's often said Mandela's speech is very wooden, very clichéd, but, but I think that he self-consciously, self-reflexively used cliché as a way of reaching out, uh, as a way of insisting upon concord, as a way of proposing consensus. Uh, so, for, for examples of his clichés, very starkly polarized binaries, dark, light, a favorite imagery of dark, light, life, death, uh, African people, white government, uh, black domination, white domination, as I'll touch on again in a moment. And then also some predictable imagery from the, from the Bible, largely, of he was a mission-educated boy, uh, a Christian mission-educated boy. The predictable imagery then of extensive battles, battles for freedom, of long walks, long walk to freedom and of slow upward climbs. Uh, Clichés supported or endorsed by citations from not only the Bible, but also from William Shakespeare, and interestingly, Jawaharlal Nehru, the, the uh, first Prime Minister of India. Mandela often quotes from, well, often, uh, on several occasions that I've identified, uh, quotes uh, in unacknowledged ways from Nehru, long walk to freedom, this is Nehru's phrase now so associated with Mandela, but, uh, but in fact, here is phrase. So, just a bit more uh, with an eye on the time on his, on his speeches. The speeches could kind of group around the, 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 the first uh, phase of his career before the, the Robben Island years, and then the speeches that he gave uh, on, uh, on, on walking out uh, of prison on his release. Mandela's big speeches under apartheid tended to, in the main, to explain and justify significant changes or new initiatives in the liberation struggle. Post-1990, his talks marked important occasions and were used to declaim and to persuade, as well as to castigate and to cajole. If earlier his focus was policy, later it was moral teaching, admonishment and the giving of advice. These were speeches we could say of a figurehead of, of a symbol, uh, uh, of no longer of a policymaker. And that shift is reflected also, and I'll touch on this again at least once, that shift is reflected also in the move in terms of re the rhetorical figures that Mandela used, in the move from those binaries that I was touching on, dark, light, light, death, to images of coming together, of walking together along that long road to freedom. Mandela was particularly good at using a speech to call a certain historical moment or mode of political awareness into being. For example, that famous statement from the doc at the end of his, his uh, Rebonia trial, uh, the, his trial for treason in April 1964, uh, which is still, I think, his greatest speech, his most well-known speech too, declared his African National Congress to be implacably opposed to racialism of all kinds, and thereby powerfully committed his movement 
in the eyes of the world to resisting white domination and black domination. There's famous lines at the end of that speech. I have worked against black domination and I have worked against white domination. In with those words, Mandela launched the South African struggle internationally, the anti-apartheid struggle internationally under a non-racial banner. On that very first occasion, the eyes of the world were turned on him. Up to this point, people, international leaders did not know about Mandela. And that was the moment through which he launched himself into like, world consciousness. Also at his trial in 62, there were two trials actually, that led to Mandela being incarcerated for 27 and a half years. At that first trial in 1962, Mandela chose after consultation to represent himself in the dock, rightly thinking that the direct form of address that this afforded him would create an ideal opportunity for broadcasting the political vision of the already banned African National Congress. As a lawyer, he was acutely aware that the space of the court could be used as political theatre. It was a place unconstrained, like no, none other in the country, by the discriminatory restrictions that had been imposed on the black South African majority. So through speaking from this place, he was almost uniquely free to, to speak freely, uh, to, to, to say whatever he wanted to say, and to put across uh, the vision, his own political vision. As the French philosopher Jacques Derrida noted in a, in a now quite well-known essay about Mandela's spirit of justice. Mandela, by appealing over the heads of his judges, representatives of a debased law, self-consciously stood, set himself up as standing for uh, higher justice. He's in in uh, Derrida's words, he set himself against the code within the code and became the ultimate expression of the rationalist legal traditions associated with the Enlightenment, self-consciously so. Before his trial, several of Mandela's notable speeches were in different ways preoccupied with explaining the African National Congress's turn to armed resistance, to militancy, both the movement as a whole and both within the movement as a whole and more widely. A particularly vivid example is a land ruled by the gun, which was delivered at a meeting of the Organization of African Unity in Addis Ababa in January 1962. In the, with this speech, Mandela set about, again, transmitting the ANC's new militant message to Africa. It had, had represented a long process of debate to move to a militant position. But what he wanted to do with this speech was to, to put that argument across to, if you like, Africa at large. In order to justify that shift from passive resistance, as I was saying, Gandhi inspired passive resistance to armed struggle, Mandela put forward an uncompromising binary. There were only two choices left facing South Africa, he, he, he said, to submit or to fight. Submission meant self-negation. It meant self-hatred. The way of life was to fight. There was, in other words, no third way, no longer a road of passive resistance. Where the opposition was armed, a land ruled by the gun, the state would not hesitate to use guns against armed civilians, and therefore a passive fight, passive resistance, meant death. And again, we see that the, the change from that strong binary position to what then happened 30 years on. In contrast with his major speeches before his long incarceration, Mandela's speech from Cape Town City Hall on the 11th of February 1990, the day of his release, was perceived by many to be over formal and formulaic. In fact, it was, it was panned, this, his speech on, on walking into freedom, by many, many critics. Many found it disappointing, including many in, in South Africa who had waited so many years for this great man to walk into freedom. What he did was he expressed determination to progress the fight for freedom on every front. However, uh, he, he left room for uh, the possibility of considering a number of different fronts on which to progress. And what he was concerned to do very clearly was to reassure the African National Congress leadership abroad that 
he was still committed at that point to the armed struggle, even though he was moving to negotiation. So the entire speech operated as a long-winded salutation to the African National Congress's many supporting constituencies, and as such was a tactical triumph. At the time of the re-emergence of this leader in waiting, the chief concern of Mandela and his advisors was to assert collective leadership and dispel suspicions regarding Mandela's possible collaboration with the enemy. Okay? So what he did was he effectively launched a position paper. He, he reiterated all the old principles of submit or fight in order to reassure his supporters. But he also appeared very rational, very calm, very considered, and so too he was reassuring his uh, interlocutors, his, his opposition. By and by then, the newly emerged leader began to appear in a softer, more reassuring light to his enemies as his message took hold. In meeting after meeting as he traversed the country to promote a new path to negotiation and, as he called it, talks <coughs> about talks, Mandela rejected bitterness, praised the integrity of his opponents, acted in deliberately self-effacing ways, and strategically and dramatically seemed always to defer to the people's will. And what we start to see in these speeches post his release is how he is constantly thinking about how these words are coming across to all interlocutors, both to his supporters and to his opposition. It's this very interesting ability to see an argument from several different, or case, to view it from several different points of view. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But just to, just to close this section about Mandela's speeches, I just want to touch on uh, his Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech, 1993, because it's in a way was, was classic Mandela, but it was also giving us a sense of where he was moving. Throughout this particular speech, Nobel Prize acceptance speech, the remarks were short and to the point. Though referring to the great ideals behind which he had always rallied, justice, respect for human rights, democracy. Throughout, too, partial though still recognizable references were made, even if in passing, to the great core texts to which he had repeatedly had recourse. In other words, to his favorite cliches. Okay? Again, it's a very cliche-ridden speech. So the Bible figures very, very prominently. Um, images of reaping the rewards of freedom, the coming of a new earth, uh, the children of paradise, uh, and also recourse to his other standard source, Shakespeare, uh, the idea of taking the tide at its flood, as in Hamlet, which, which harks us back uh, to the quotation from Measure to Measure uh, about, about being prepared to die, which, with which he ended his speech back in 1964, with which I began this section. So, now I want to, you have to go through Barack Obama again. I want to move on to thinking about practice and theory. Mandela as a theorist in practice. Uh, in part through this practice of his speech making, as I've already laid down there, but also in other ways too. Uh, and. Um, with more time, I could make a case for how Mandela worked through uh, and towards some of his positions on reconciliation, through how to deal with uh, his opponent, uh, his, his apartheid opponent, through gardening, through the, the, the long, slow digging of gardening on Robben Island. This is a photograph that has only emerged post Mandela's release. It is taken of, of Mandela gardening in Robben Island in about 1974, I think. Um, so I, I use that picture of Mandela the gardener uh, to, to head up this section on theory into practice. <coughs> what is now enshrined as Mandela's, or acclaimed internationally as Mandela's reconciliatory ethic, was developed, I want to submit, both on the job and in close collaboration, in discussion with comrades and colleagues on the struggle front line, in the courtroom, as I suggested, in the kitchens and offices of the various dwellings he inhabited, 
and in the various seminar discussions and debates that he held on Robben Island with those he had been imprisoned with, most notably again for to Sisulu. <clears throat> for the benefit of historical hindsight, it's clear that Mandela's co collaborative political work shaped the cr critical and creative parameters of at least two generations of South African writers, in fact. This is a bit of an aside, but I'll just leave, leave it with you to think about. That, that this collaborative ethic shaped creative practice more widely in South Africa. For example, the work of the poet Dennis Brutus, the critic and novelist Njibulo Ndebele, the poet and critic Jeremy Cronin, and the novelist Ahmad Dan Wall. I'm aware that some of you out there are, are English literature students, so that may be something you'd like to think about. Also with the benefit of hindsight, it's now clear that it was during the near three decades of his imprisonment that Mandela came to develop some of his most paradigmatic, we would, might like to say, post-colonial shifts, turns, and approaches. His capacity for the long game of defeating his enemy, not by patience alone, important as that was, but, as I already suggested, by the ability to see from the point of view of the other. His finely honed skill of weighing a problem from various different angles, both oblique and direct. His deliberate yet subtle movement away from armed struggle and towards structured negotiation, though always supported in the early years by the uncompromising threat of a return to violence should negotiation fail. If deft political and social footwork was an ability that Mandela brought with him to Robben Island, the challenging conditions of life in prison vastly expanded and fine-tuned his skills for conversation, for negotiation, for, if you like, developing a theory of reconciliation through practice. In a post-colonial word, word, Mandela on Robben Island and later in his other prisons out-mimicked both friend and foe in the interests of forging solidarity in a path beyond conflict. A mission school product, he had long ago discovered that to gain the upper hand in any situation of conflict meant outmaneuvering and outmastering the master, looking at any situation from the point of view of the authority and the victim at one and the same time. And he was fascinated when on Robben Island, prisoners, the political prisoners put on a production of Sophocles Antigone, and he wanted the position of Creon want the position of the, of the lawmaker, of the authority figure, because he also understood the situation from the vantage point of the team, vantage point of the victim and the supplicant figure. And also, just as an aside, he, Mandela on Robben Island was uh, a famous, a famous amongst his circle of political prisoners, chess player. But he was also very frustrating for the opposition. Why? Because he spent an entire day sometimes working out a move. And he would walk around the board, round and round, looking at the chess pieces from the point of view of his opponent in the chess game, as well as from his own point of view. Working out the problem in the round, if you like. It's, it's I think, a, a very, very revealing uh, feature of Mandela's practice. During those years in prison then, Mandela came by his own admission to realize that most problems and disagreements could be solved through the judicious balancing and counterbalancing of different options, as if the problem were an impasse in an island, in a Robben Island chess game. On Robben Island, the political prisoners, all intellectually disciplined, politically experienced men, were in the unique position of being able to ponder political issues and processes, resistance, negotiation, etc. in detail and from every available angle, on and on for years. Remember that these guys had time <coughs> in their hands. The, until 1989, there was no sense of an exit ticket or an exit date. So they, you know, if you wanted to spend an entire day on one move in a chess game, you could do that. In effect, as Fran Buntman suggests in her analysis of the island's political culture, the prisoners' efforts to set up through their interactions and discussions an orderly political microcosm transformed their incarceration in recognizably, you might say, post-colonial or dialogic ways 
from a reactive experience to an experience of forging together a productive new social contract. As one of the more charismatic and politically astute of those present, Mandela was central to this process of transformation. Yet, and it's worth reiterating, the converse also pertains. That culture of dialogue, the interactive codes of listening and slow considered response developed across the years were fundamental to how Mandela arrived at what he called his negotiating concept in the mid-1980s. In other words, his decision to begin to deal with the African government and to plan for extensive talks. Now I'm going to, uh, in the interest of time, I would like to move on perhaps a little bit more rapidly than I had planned to, uh, to my final stage in this talk, um, to Mandela's reaching out uh, to his opposition and how he did that, what his, what his, what his strategies were. So Robin Island honed Mandela's capacity for active symbolization, which he had already skill, which he had already learned skillfully to manipulate for the purposes of legal advocacy. And now he found a conceptual space where his political intellect could move with special facility, as when he attempted to approach others' perspectives, including his warders, on their own merits. Difficult debates, such as those between the African National Congress and Pan-Africanists in, in, uh, on Robben Island, he liked to imagine literally in 3D, as a drama that might be played out in a theater. Fellow prisoner Mac Maharaj once summarized Mandela's style in a very useful way. I'd like to, to quote his words here. He said, Mandela proceeded from their assumptions, as in the opposition, and carefully marshaled his arguments to move them closer to his conclusions. His line of advance was developed on the other parties line of attack. It was an intensely strategic, spatialized approach, closely resembling, we might say, a Socratic dialogue, or again, a chess game. And this is strikingly demonstrated in the tactics through which he approached the, uh, the apartheid government. And I'm calling this very short section the binding force of contiguous nationalism. And what I've chosen there for this backdrop slide is uh, a series of photographs of Mandela um, approaching both old friends, Fidel Castro, and old enemies, Afrikaners, in different positions and in different roles. The South African rugby captain, uh, winner of the World Cup in 1995, at top right, and S.W. de Klerk, his his arch opponent, really, in, uh, in negotiating for political change in South Africa. And then also here, a book just out, Zelda Lafrange, Good Morning, Mr. Mandela, uh, the, the memoir of Mandela's uh, private secretary and close personal assistant, one of the people who was closest to him in his, during his final years, uh, and, and who he insisted should be an Afrikaner, an Afrikaner woman a white African woman. The capacity for finding and building reciprocity there, the kind of reciprocity that decision-making rests upon, is particularly evident in the areas of common ground Mandela was able to find and to forge with his one-time enemy, South African Afrikaners, the architects of apartheid, who made up the national government that was quite prepared in 1964 to hang him, and quite prepared also to imprison him for nearly three decades. In essence, this encounter with his Africana opponent represented, I would want to submit, the first successful accommodation in the 20th century of a minority settler nationalism to a majority indigenous nationalism without, in Mandela's own phrase, a bloodbath ensuing. How did he do this, in a nutshell? What occurred in that rapprochement between Mandela, the African nationalist, and Afrikaners who were, crucially, equally nationalist and also proudly African? As one of Mandela's advisors pointed out, Afrikaners were happy to use the word Africa to name themselves Afrikaners. What that rapprochement involved 
was the recognition of conjoined or linked interests in a context of geographical proximity, the matching of other parallels in the world today. It involved seeing that the Africana was motivated by a similar, not to say contiguous, passion for the nation, for the land of South Africa itself, was willing to die for that land, as the African nationalist, as willing to die. It was a very, very special case of recognizing the image of the self in the eyes of the other. And there are a host of examples from Mandela's biography to illustrate this. What he did in order to forge that nation-nation reconciliation. He learned Afrikaans. He read extensively in Africana history. He began to follow rugby, which is a sort of this, the, this, the sport is a religion for Afrikaners. And there are a host of other examples. In the interest of time, my conclusion. Towards the end of Fanon's canonical call to arms, the wretched of the earth, Fanon looks forward to the day when the emergent post-colonial nation will produce, he writes, new men, new human beings. His conclusion speaks urgently of how the third world, in that time, must rehumanize the masses of humankind and rewrite history, not by imitating Europe, which always proceeds by way of deadly oppositions, but rather by making new intensified connections. Through his tentative dialogic practices, his tentative but determined dialogic practices, uh, both in prison and beyond, Mandela contributed forcefully to that redefinition of the human as proclaimed by Fanon. Yet at the same time, he pulled it in a new direction. In his view, new life, post-colonial, post-apartheid life, was not necessarily defined in contrast with colonial death, the destruction inflicted by empire. He disposed of Fanon's irrepressible violence as a sole means of making history, and instead championed conversation, dialogue, trust, and listening, and above all love, the identification of the self in the eyes of the other. Thank you very, very much.